My name is Tammy Black, and I am Allied Health, um, the Allied Health Academic Chair for the New Brunswick Community College. Very pleased to be talking about one of our two Healthy Seniors Pilot projects, as uh, was indicated a moment ago. And I'm also thankful that uh, my co-lead, co Kyle Brimer, is, is here as well. Um, after the presentation, Kyle and I will continue to be here so we can answer any questions that anyone might have. So a huge welcome to everyone. We're very excited to bring you the details about this innovative project. And uh, thank you for everyone who is in attendance today. I would like to thank our funders, uh, the Healthy Seniors Pilot Project and the New Brunswick Community College. I'd also like to thank our research team at the New Brunswick Community College, uh, University of New Brunswick St. John, and uh, the University of Manitoba. Without these collaborations, this project would not be possible. So again, thank you. New Brunswick's older adult population has increased. Uh, New Brunswick has the largest proportion of older adults in all of Canada, and this will remain so into 2030 and beyond. Today, 22.2% of New Brunswick's population is 65 or older, and by 2037, it will be 32%. 35.8% of seniors, so that's 63,424, live with a disability that has an effect on their activities of daily living. More than 3,000 New Brunswick seniors are living with some form of dementia. The more serious the condition, the higher the level of care. In Canada, 89% of care recipients report receiving care from a family member or friend, also known as an informal caregiver. In Canada, 4 in 10 care recipients are over the age of 65, and the majority of care recipients are receiving some degree of care from an informal caregiver. Only 11% of care recipients in Canada rely exclusively on paid professionals to provide care. So what does this mean for health care? For Canada, informal caregivers contribute $97.1 billion annually to the Canadian healthcare system. This means that if it weren't for informal caregivers, provinces would have to find a significant amount of money, almost $100 billion in total, for paid care. About one quarter of New Brunswickers identify as informal caregivers and they provide approximately 140 million hours per year of care, contributing $2.4 billion of care annually in our province. The literature has identified a number of challenges experienced by informal caregivers. Caregivers lack knowledge and understanding of what is needed to care for seniors at home and how to obtain the information and supports. They also face a lack of communication and information necessary, as many find it difficult to navigate the systems due to fragmentation and constant change of information. Lack of supports to cope with challenges contributes to negative effects on informal caregivers' own health and well-being. This highlights a key challenge that if we don't keep our informal caregivers healthy, both physically and psychologically, they will be less able to care for seniors and that burden will shift to the healthcare system. This project began with three goals in mind. Number one, enable informal caregivers to access services and social supports to help seniors age safely at home. Number two, bolster support for family through secondary and post-secondary education systems in New Brunswick. And then number three, support informal caregivers through accessible education and training. 
We designed and developed program curriculum for senior care navigation skills for informal caregivers and then delivered this curriculum in community settings. There were two halves of the delivery initially. In the first half, the coordinators delivered the program curriculum in a workshop. It was a blended format that was both face-to-face -face and virtual at the same time. The second half of deliveries included a number of health students uh, from MBCC and the University of New Brunswick St. John. So various programs such as practical nurse, personal support worker, and the Bachelor of Nursing program. The inclusion of students allowed for the inclusion of a respite care option, which helped with attendance of informal caregivers. Informal caregivers then late, later confidentially evaluated this delivery. So you can see here, these are some of our students preparing to deliver the workshops. Each workshop that was delivered uh, was delivered over four days and it lasted approximately three to five hours per day. Health students delivered the curriculum to the informal caregiver participants and at the same time another group of students facilitated respite care in a senior or adult day center where students and older adults experienced intergenerationality. In the respite center, students provided social, recreational, and therapeutic activities for the older adults. In the workshops, participants were given the opportunity to network and learn about the aging process in terms of needs and, and levels of care and, and various demands. They also learned about available supports and services for seniors aging in place, how to navigate those resources online with laptops purchased for this activity, and how to de develop care plans and implement safety and prevention strategies and other fundamental skills for the senior that they care for. Transportation was provided for those who requested assistance and local food services were also showcased at lunchtime. These were um, guest speakers um, or there were guest speakers as well, um, including 211, FCNB, Meals on Wheels and NB Grubhub. And of course, FCNB is the New Brunswick Financial and Consumer Services Commission. To assess the impact of these workshops, we had our participants fill out questionnaires before and after each workshop, and then again, at least six weeks later. These packages contained questionnaires that were developed for program evaluation, as well as measures of caregiver quality of life, preparedness for caregiving, and loneliness. So to date, 19 workshops have been delivered to 140 informal caregivers. At the time of final reporting in the spring, we had delivered to 114 individuals. Of these, 90 met our criteria as an informal caregiver of a senior. And we're certainly updating this information because there are more people uh, who have been involved since. The workshops were placed in both community and long-term care settings, providing informal caregivers with options for virtual participation and on-site participation, as well as respite care should they be on-site. Over 160 NBCC and UMB health students under the supervision of licensed health professionals helped to deliver the workshops by aiding in instruction, and resource na navigation. Students also increased the capacity of the workshops by providing respite care for seniors, allowing full caregiver participation in their learning. Just before we began to deliver the workshops, we agreed on 13 goals that the workshop could accomplish. And these served as metrics for success along the way. Examples of these goals are 
understand the importance of self-care and wellness for the caregiver themselves. Um, knowing how to access community services and social supports for older adults was another one. And another was being comfortable using technology to access supports. So again, there were 13 goals in total. Participants completed a questionnaire that was designed to evaluate these 13 goals and did so just before the workshop, after completion of the workshop, and then again um, at six weeks following completed workshops. The results of our program evaluation revealed that all 13 goals were met at the conclusion of the workshops and also when measured at follow-up six weeks later. A questionnaire administered to participants evaluated specific aspects of the workshop quality and participants revealed an overwhelmingly positive view of the components of the program. In addition to the program evaluation suggesting that these were successful senior care navigation and care skills development workshops, we also found improvements in caregiver quality of life. These increases in quality of life appeared both immediately after the workshop and they, pers they persisted at follow-up six weeks later. Additionally, there was evidence that the workshop increased the preparedness for caregiving. This increase was noted immediately following the workshop and again persisted to greater than six weeks later. We know that caregiving can isolate people and lead to loneliness in terms of romantic, family, and social relationships. Importantly, extended loneliness has a similar negative effect on health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Our data revealed the more lonesome a caregiver feels, the lower their quality of life and also the more prepared caregivers felt, the greater their quality of life. Taken together, this evidence suggests that intervention strategies to improve caregiver quality of life should focus on reducing feelings of loneliness and better preparing the informal caregiver. We had many participant testimonials and this is a part of a letter from two participants who said, we feel confident we now have the training and tools to navigate the complicated health and social systems, easing some of the strain on our already overburdened health providers. But more importantly, we now have the ability and support to enjoy our senior years in our own home rather than in a facility. Some other testimonials included uh, some informal caregivers expressed relief that our, their situations could be improved. Socially isolated caregivers were able to take part in the workshops in a virtual capacity. One caregiver uh, gained the confidence to ask another caregiver in the workshop for help, allowing her to go to Costco for the first time in two years. She shared how she and the senior in her care became members of a local recreational facility. This after learning of the importance of activity and self-care for the informal caregiver. One participant gained the skill to have a difficult conversation with her mother while preserving her mom's dignity. Her mother then willingly accepted care at home. Social networks and friendships were developed in class, some acting as caregivers for the other. Informal caregivers took comfort in knowing that their loved one was taking part in meaningful social activities in a safe adult day center with nursing students while the informal caregiver learned. Students who took part in respite care expressed enthusiasm and at least four uh, seniors in their care became fast friends while building supportive relationships with each other. One caregiver expressed an improvement in their loved one's speech after they interacted for four days with health students in respite care. And the coordinators, LPNs themselves, witnessed older adults becoming more communicative over the four-day senior day center experience. 
We recognize a number of impacts at various levels. In terms of individual level impacts, the results just presented indicate at the level of the individual, these workshops improved quality of life and readiness for caregiving in informal caregivers. These improvements could mean the informal caregivers may be able to keep their loved ones at home longer. In terms of community level impacts, at a community level, this student infused community based pilot program was delivered in six different communities so far St. Stephen, St. John, Grand Bay Westfield, Hampton, Sussex, and Belle Isle. On 13 different occasions at, at time of final reporting. And again, we are actually up to 19 now. If we can improve preparedness for caregiving and caregiver quality of life and keep older adults aging in place, this preserves communities and leaves long-term care homes for those who truly qualify. And in terms of system level impacts, these programs have capitalized on the students' need for work integrated learning opportunities in community nursing. The project offered an opportunity for professional development for healthcare students by exposing them to various resources available to seniors and providing experiential learning to showcase the value of respite care. Students who would not have considered working with the geriatric population have now expressed a desire to work with older adults after graduation. This training program is achievable and recreatable in other communities, allowing for health students to educate additional informal caregivers to improve caregiver quality of life and increase preparedness for caregiving, which could reduce caregiver burnout and health care burden. So when thinking about return on investment, first, it's important to consider the scale of the challenge. With the increasing older population, there will also be an increased need for informed and healthy informal caregivers, keeping the seniors they care for at home. In New Brunswick, the number of older adults awaiting nursing home beds totaled 660 names as of 2020. And this is predicted to increase to 4,100 by the year 2030. This backlog of older adults requiring care services results in informal caregivers providing the bulk of care duties. By providing support to informal caregivers, physical and mental health may be maintained, allowing them to sustain their significant contribution to the healthcare system. As I indicated earlier, in New Brunswick, the contribution of informal caregivers is equal to $2.4 billion annually. As our province has the largest proportion of seniors in Canada, it is reasonable to suggest that informal caregivers are providing this significant amount of care for seniors in the province at no cost to the healthcare system. While this number does represent a proportion of healthcare spending not directly incurred by the provincial government. It has the unintended consequence of resulting in significant levels of informal caregiver burnout. Burnout has direct costs to the healthcare system as it is accompanied by significant physical and mental health deterioration of the caregiver. Moreover, when this population is sick, the level of informal care provided to older adults they're responsible for declines. This results in a double hit to the healthcare system that could easily outweigh the cost of this pilot project, which so far has educated uh, 114 New Brunswick informal caregivers. And uh, at the time of reporting, it was um, 107. And, and to date, as of today, it's 140. But going by that math, return on investment grows quickly when you consider that in 2014, it cost $3,437 per month for nursing home care. So with these informal caregivers, if we only consider 
107 of the informal caregivers that we've worked with so far. We, if we have prevented or stalled the nursing home admissions of 107 seniors in their care for one year alone, we may have saved upwards of $4.4 million. So that's $3,437 per month per resident times 107 residents, and of course, 12 months per out of the year, or 4.4 million. And we recognize with each informal caregiver that we train, um, that number is growing, and our number is really closer at this point to, um, to 5 million. So with scale up and expansion of this pro uh, program, there could be a potential savings of twice that by doubling our cohort. Our team would like to share with you a paper that outlines uh, this project in greater detail, indicating the implications of our findings and explaining the student infused model of uh, senior care navigation and care skills development. So in summary, Senior care navigation and care skills development is a student infused model of service delivery. It is a social program and it is also experiential learning for many future healthcare workers. And it has also been a very significant applied research opportunity. Although at this point, we're beginning to translate our research into practice and of course, research involving informal caregivers. I thank you so much for, for your review and keen interest in these, in these projects. We wanted to, to show you our sustainability and scale up plan at this point. So with respect to senior care navigation and care skills development, we are going to continue to utilize hundreds of senior health students. And I think it would be worthwhile for you to know that uh, through advocacy uh, from uh, both the Department of Health and Social Development, um, we received a letter in August of 2024 from Alicia Godet and her team at Social Development that um, provided additional funding to the New Brunswick Community College up to the end of March of 2025 to continue the the uh, scale up of this project and uh, to be to, to begin translating our research into practice. So this is very much appreciated. And at this time, again, we are we are planning 10 workshops over the next um, so many months to the end of March with a goal of providing education for 30 informal caregivers per workshop. Now uh, we're, we're continue, continually bringing in um, new, new recruit. Recruitment is very important to us. Uh, but we were envisioning 15 informal caregivers on site and 15 virtually if, if possible. We've uh, utilized almost 200 senior care, um, senior health students at this point between NBCC and UNB. So in this coming year, we would like to continue that and, uh, um, you know, have new students take part. We also want to expand outreach, outreach to underserved rural areas. So very interestingly, um, during our first two years of the project, we delivered primarily in southwestern New Brunswick, as you heard during the presentation. And now over, over the next um, seven months, we are expanding to all six campuses of the New Brunswick Community College and beginning to um, develop new uh, partnerships with UNB. Um, so we've already been working with UNB St. John and we're beginning to work with UNB Fredericton and also uh, UNB in the Moncton area. So starting to expand. Our six campuses are St. John, Moncton, Fredericton, Woodstock, Miramichi, and St. Andrews. So uh, we're very excited about that expansion. And again, that is happening over the next seven months. And we will be delivering these 10 workshops in those six key areas. We're also going to be emphasizing intergenerationality. 
so continuing really to do to do so. We're also going to add EECD. We are currently a strong partner in the Center of Excellence in Health for EECD. And we're beginning to bring secondary students from various high schools um, across New Brunswick into the Senior Care Navigation and Care Skills Development Workshops in an observational uh, role for, uh, for their co-op, uh, just for example. We have a neighbor, Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick, and we're in conversations about including uh, their medicine students as well. We would also like to design and develop additional curriculum. Right now, these workshops are based on two key pieces of curriculum, two courses, um, and those two courses are 12 hours of curriculum at cur uh, currently. We would like to add a course three, which um, is managing age-related conditions, and there would be a focus on experiential learning for the uh, informal caregivers for such skills as communication, hygiene, and personal care. So we have started conversations with our own curriculum department at MBCC and are looking to design and develop that additional piece of curriculum this year. We're also developing a how-to manual, as we did in our other project, Student-Infused Pulmonary Rehabilitation. This how-to manual will be in both English and French, and it is our intention to mentor CCNB so that they too can deliver the same student-infused senior care navigation and care skills development program for informal caregivers in Francophone communities. So we're very excited about this and um, I'm very excited to tell you that our work continues over the next over the next seven months. In actuality, we just received the funding um, in mid-August, so we're very excited to to share that with you. In terms of next steps, after March of uh, 2025. We, we currently don't have funding secured, uh, but we're going to work very hard at securing additional funding. And this is just an example of the operating budget. As the years go by, um, obviously that could change slightly, uh, but it is a bit of an average over, over a five-year budget that we've put together. And we really do want to continue to translate our research into practice. We want to continue to evaluate senior care navigation and care skills development. We want to continue to work with the province on the questions that need to be uh, answered because we have uh, a key demographic here that we could be asking questions of. We wish to maintain the Student Infused Senior Care Navigation Care Skills Development Program at NBCC and continue to deliver it across the six campuses. And we're truly excited to, to be spanning out to those six campuses this year. And we do want to continue to involve more students from all of those areas and more participants from all of those areas annually. And again, it, continue to expand our services to underserved communities and, um, you know, continue to train and uh, primarily looking at training CCNB and provide consistent clinical placements for nursing students from MBCC and UNB um, in, in this area. This is a picture of Tucker Park in St. John. This is where our two uh, student infused projects have originated from, the Allied Health Education Center. Uh, you can see that we're co-located with the University of New Brunswick, St. John, also Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick, and the St. John Regional Hospital. Uh, so we have established a student infused lab at NBCC's Allied Health Education Center that is co-located with, uh, with these institutions. And so the Interprofessional Student Infused Lab at the Allied Health Education Center on Tucker Park really has been and continues to be an excellent site for continued uh, research and also program evaluation. Um, 
and translating this this research to practice in the area of informal caregivers and aging in place and of course pulmonary medicine as well if we consider our other project. So thank you so much. Uh, I did want to say as well that um, many of you would have been in attendance for the knowledge translation session that we did last year on our student infused pulmonary rehab project. And um, you may be interested to know that we presented again in June for the Premier and also for Minister Fitch and um, uh, other members of uh, uh, the Department of Health, other representatives from the Department of Health. And we were delighted to learn through a letter from Veronique Taylor uh, a couple of weeks later that the Department of Health had advocated for funding to carry our student infused pulmonary rehab project for to March 31st, 2025. So we're very excited to let you know that that project has also been extended for another year. Um, 